Hi, this is Ron Sipsik, and this is the fourth segment in a four-part series on labor market theory. In the last segment, we looked at the profit-maximizing employment level and applied that to the minimum wage, uh, minimum wage policy. In this particular segment, we're going to take the uh, labor market model that we've developed and we're going to do some other applications with it. In the first case, I'd like to take a look at immigration. We'll also take a look at other factors that affect the supply of labor and therefore what factors uh, impact wages and employment levels. And then we'll wrap up this segment by taking a look at uh, a key factor that affects the demand side of the model. Um, certainly in the United States, immigration is in the news, particularly immigration from Mexico. There's a lot of concern uh, wherever you stand on the issue, there's a lot of concern about whether or not uh, our immigration standards should be strengthened or loosened, liberalized. Our, uh, um, our point in bringing this up, my point in bringing this up, is not to really get into the normative side of it, um, but simply to take a look at some basic issues, re re uh, theoretical issues related to immigration. Let's just, for the sake of argument, say that um, the United States liberalizes its immigration with Mexico, makes it easier for people to legally immigrate from Mexico uh, into the United States. What, what would be the effect on uh, labor markets, particularly labor markets for unskilled, relatively unskilled labor? Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who comes from Mexico is relatively unskilled, but uh, a lot of labor that does come from south of the border uh, compared to U.S. labor is on the, on the lower end of the skill continuum. How does that affect uh, markets, labor markets in the United States? Let's take a look at this. So let's say that we liberalize immigration. What that would do is that would shift the supply curve. That would shift the supply curve. That, that was a very poor attempt at a, at a straight line. I think I can do better than that. In fact, I know I can do better at that, and the way I can do better at that is I can use a function which allows me to draw a straight line. All right, so back to our regular programming here. Suppose that the United States liberalizes or makes it easier for people to immigrate from Mexico to the United States. The supply curve for unskilled labor would shift to the right. All right, so let's go ahead and draw that. I'm going to put that in blue. And Let's label that as a shift in the supply curve to the right. So this is an increase, increase in supply, and this would do to increased um, liberalization. Liberalization means that we're making it easier for people to come to the United States. So increased liberalization. Now the effect of that would be to drive the wage rate down in this particular labor market and drive the employment rate up. So as more people are allowed to immigrate to the United States, uh, it will be easier for people to come to the United States and work in the United States legally, and that would drive the supply curve to the right, push the wage rate down, push the employment level up. The lower wage would feed across to the firm and basically reduce the cost of labor. If there are more people willing to work in that particular labor market, then it's going to reduce wages and it's going to reduce the cost of hiring this type of labor. And the SMFC curve will shift down and if wage rates have in fact dropped, then firms are going to find that it's more attractive to hire labor. Now, this often leads, this diagram is, is behind some of the thinking that immigration lowers wage rates in the United States. And in fact, it can do that if, in fact, immigrants are competing against Americans. Uh, actually, economic research regarding uh, immigration from Mexico is, is, it doesn't, doesn't conclude that immigration from Mexico really lowers U.S. wage rates. And the, the thesis is that many of the workers who come from Mexico don't actually compete against Americans. They actually compete against other immigrants for the jobs that they get. For instance, you know, if people are coming from Mexico and working in agricultural fields in the Southwest, say Southern California, 
many of the people that are coming in are going to be competing against people that have already come in and are working in those fields. So it's very likely that more immigration would lower the wages of immigrant workers, but it's very likely that more immigration from Mexico would have very little or no effect on uh, labor markets where Americans tend to work. All right, so this idea that immigration lowers wages in the United States may not be in fact that accurate. It may actually drive down the wages of immigrants, which makes it less attractive to be an immigrant, immigrant worker in the United States. So it's very interesting that actually if you opened up the border um, and allowed more illegal immigrant or more legal immigration of people from south of the border, you might actually make it less desirable to come here if in fact the reasons for coming here are economic. All right, so that's an interesting, interesting sidelight here. Um, of course, if, if the United States tightens up on immigration, it has just the opposite effect. It actually drives the supply curve to the left, pushes wages higher, pushes employment rates down, raises the cost of U.S. companies that hire this type of labor, and reduces the employment level. Of course, if you drive up the wages of illegal immigrants or immigrants, you make it more attractive for people to immigrate here illegally. So you're more likely to see people doing things to cross the border illegally. That's kind of a paradox. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on. I would like to look at a couple other factors that affect the, uh, the supply curve for labor and therefore impact wage rates. Um, there's a couple other factors that I'd like to bring up at this point. One, um, anything that is going to increase training requirements is going to reduce the amount of supply of labor. And anything that decreases the desirability of the work um, Will also, will also reduce supply. So here are two factors that tend to decrease the supply of labor. So let's, let's actually go ahead and graph this and, um, and show the effects. So laws that increase training requirements or any social changes uh, where people begin to view a certain occupation as less desirable it's very likely the supply curve is going to move to the left. Okay, Of course, if you turn the arrows around, it'd be just the opposite. Anything that reduces training requirements or increases the desirability of the work shifts the supply curve to the right. So we'll actually, um, we'll actually show the decrease in supply here. Let's go ahead and do that. So we move from S1 to S2. This pushes the wage rate up, the equilibrium wage rate up. It also pushes the employment level down. And this feeds back to the firm in the way of what? Higher wages. And higher wages mean what? Higher cost. So this is S MFC 2. And if you've raised the cost of labor, you're basically inviting the firm to hire less of it everything else held constant. So higher training requirements um, or lower desirability of work, this tends to push wages up and move employment levels down. So generally in freely operating labor markets you gotta pay people more who are trained more and uh, you have to generally pay for less, more for less desirable work. So jobs that are very undesirable often pay more than other jobs, everything else held constant, because you basically have to bribe people to do undesirable work. And that's what the model shows. Okay? So we've shown some nice factors on the supply side. Of course, you should be able to turn the arrows around and run the model in reverse. All right. Let's go down to the demand side. This will take a little bit longer. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, complex. So let me, I want to show you something. I'm going to move all the way down below this model, and I'll come back up to it. A uh, very, very important principle in economics um, related to the demand side. If there's an increase in the demand 
for the, for the final product for the final product then that's going to increase the price of the final product okay and I could draw a demand curve and a supply curve for the final product and show you this but just imagine that if the demand curve for avocados is shifting to the right there will be an increase in the price of avocados well this is going to if there's an increase in the price of avocados that's going to increase the value of workers that produce avocados remember the value of marginal product what is this it's the marginal product times the price so if the price of the final product increases and we hold marginal product constant but if the price of the final product increases well what's that going to do that's going to increase the value of the workers who make that product well how's that going to affect employers that's going to cause employers to want to demand more of these types of workers so this will increase the demand for labor who makes this product so we I have a feeling that you already knew this you would have known this whether you had taken the course or not or watched the video or not that an increase in the demand for the final product ultimately increases the demand for the labor that makes that product okay and so that's just intuitive now what I've shown you though is the transmission mechanism here the transmission mechanism is through P and B and P and somebody who's been trained in labor economics knows that all right so let's go ahead and go up to up to the model and let's actually illustrate this now what I'm drawing up here is not the product market but I'm drawing the labor market so I'm, I'm showing actually uh, let me just go ahead and show you this that the the left side of this model the left side of this model this is the product side of the model okay and then this is the labor side of the model so what we're going to be illustrating is actually this right side over here this is the side we're going to be illustrating okay let's go ahead and do that All right, and the first thing we want to do is we want to shift the BMP curve to the right. So, if there is, if workers are becoming more valuable because the price of what they sell, make and sell, is um, increasing, then the BMP curve, BMP curve shifts to the right. So let's let's show that. We've already moved it. Let's just go ahead and label it. So the VMP curve shifts to the right. Now let's not equilibriate that yet. Let's not uh, sketch down yet. Just, just hold on to that. And remember the demand curve is the sum of the VMPs. So anything, if the VMP curves of individual firms are moving to the right, which they are, then that's ultimately going to shift the demand curve for all of this labor to the right so we move from D1 to D2 so we'll call this letter A in our thinking we'll call this letter B in our thinking so letter A happens first A causes B now if the demand curve for labor is sh shifting to the right well that's going to push up the wage so the wage rate increases and that's going to push up the employment level so L E two, right? So this is going to be C in our thinking, and this will be C in our thinking. So the increase in BMP, workers are more valuable because they're making something that has a higher price. That's going to increase the overall labor market demand for the product, which will push up the wage rate to those workers and push up the employment levels. The higher wage will feed back across and will lead to a higher MFC curve. So we'll call this S MFC 2. Here's MFC equals VMP 2 
and this is Lm2. So even though this increase in uh, MFC we'll call letter D, even though the wage rate has risen, the firm is actually hiring more labor. Why is it? Because notice the increase in the value of the labor has exceeded the increase in MFC. If you actually measure the, the horizontal distance between the VMP curves and compare it to the horizontal distance between the MFC curves, you'd actually see that the movement in VMP is greater than the movement in MFC. So we actually can come down and write that. So let's do that. So the increase in VMP exceeds the increase in MFC, which means there's an increase in LM. So the firm does not mind paying workers more. This is a higher wage right here. The firm does not mind paying workers more so long as the gain in VMP exceeds the gain in wage. So if the, if, if the value of the worker is increasing faster than the cost of the worker, then the firm is happy to pay the worker more and employ more workers. So this is the ideal scenario. This is the ideal case for someone. You want to be employed in a market where the value of what you're making is increasing. If the value of what you're making is increasing, you can be paid high wages and there will be significant employment opportunities. Okay? All right, so let's just go ahead back up here and we'll take a peek at that and uh, wrap it up. So, again, um, higher wages, companies gladly pay higher wages to workers who are becoming increasingly valuable. All right, it's that simple. All right, that concludes our series on basic labor market theory. This, all of this analysis has applied to a firm, to an employer, who is both a price taker and a wage taker. So in other words, we've assumed a competitive output market, and we've assumed a competitive labor market.